25th here in Seoul. Coming up on News Center tonight. North Korea fires two missiles at high altitude into the East Sea today, its first launch since May. And now the big question is how this will affect North Korea-U.S. nuclear talks. South Korea proves to Russia during working level talks that one of its warplanes did violate Korean airspace earlier this week. Newly appointed U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper, meanwhile, seems to be backing Seoul's claim, saying he will discuss the matter when he visits Korea and Japan. South Korea and Japan clash at the WTO over Tokyo's trade restrictions against Seoul. The heat of debate comes as Japan continues to block key tech exports to Korea, causing concern for local firms. And Seoul's finance ministry revises the country's tax code to benefit local companies. The revision is aimed at encouraging investment. New Centre begins now. And welcome to Editing News Center, coming to you live from Seoul. I'm Izzy Yoon. And I'm Noah Dam. Thank you, as always, for joining us this evening. Now, just a few weeks ago, it was handshakes and smiles when North Korean leader Kim Jong un and US President Donald Trump met at the DMZ. But the North might have made things even more complicated now by launching two projectiles in which the South Korean military presumes are short range missiles into the East Sea. And for more, let's get straight to our Defense Ministry correspondent, Kim ji -yeon. Now, ji -yeon, have we learned anything new about North Korea's launch? I'm afraid not, and it's highly unlikely that Seoul's Defense Ministry will give more details about the latest launch, at least for today. Uh, given my past experience when us reporters were briefed about North Korea's launch in May. And the most recent piece of news was about the flying distance of the second short-range missile, in which South Korea's Joint Chiefs of South Sef flew some 690 kilometers from North Korea's eastern city of Wonsan towards the East Sea. As to how the second missile flew nearly 700 kilometers, that puts nearly all of the South Korean territory in its range, is a big question. And this is why it's stating the projectile is presuming to be missiles is presuming to be projectiles because it could be a new tactical guided weapon. Another question is on whether it's likely to be a North Korean version of Russia's Iskander class missile, which can carry nuclear warheads and can invade, evade existing anti missile systems. The military said. It's presumed to have been launched from the ground using a transporter erector launcher, which means the missile could be moved to be uh, from a desired location and not bound to a standard missile launch site, making it harder to predict North Korea's movements in advance. The same goes for the first short-range missile, which flew some 430 kilometers at 5.34 a.m. Thursday, 23 minutes before the second missile in the same ones on location, both of them with altitudes between 50 and 60 kilometers. The first missile flew some 200 kilometers further than the one launched by the North in May this year. Regarding North Korea's firing of projectiles presumed to be short-range missiles this morning, after the last one fired in May, South Korea and U.S. military are currently sharing information and are analyzing data in detail. The South Korean government has been monitoring the situation and urges North Korea to halt such actions, which are not helpful in lowering military tensions on the Korean peninsula. As to whether Seoul's defense ministry views the recent launch as a violation of the inter-Korean comprehensive military agreement signed by the two Koreas last September to alleviate military tensions in the peninsula, the spokesperson said the firing goes against the spirit of the said agreement. Now, Jiyeon, tell us more about the area the missiles were launched from Wonsan, and how do you expect this to affect the denuclearization talks? Well, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said that it's been closely watching the Wonsan area, and Kim Jong-un has been spotted, has been making public appearances there. And it's speculated that Kim Jong-un could have been at the site when uh, the launches were made this morning. It also believes that summertime military drills are currently underway in the north. And earlier this week, the north showed Kim Jong-un 
inspecting a new submarine, a move believed to be aimed at trying to raise pressure to get an upper hand ahead of possible nuclear talks with Washington. There's also speculation the recent long launch could delay the resumption of working level talks stated between Pyongyang and Washington. And North Korea has said the planned joint military drill between Seoul and Washington goes against the pledge to improve relations uh, made by President Trump to Kim Jong-un. Back to you. Meanwhile, North Korea's missile launch was set to top the agenda at today's National Security Council meeting. And according to Blue House Deputy Spokesperson Han Jung-woo, the regular meeting chaired by National Security Advisor Chung Eun-yong was scheduled for this afternoon. However, we're still waiting for the details of the discussions to come out. The spokesperson also said that President Moon Jae-in was briefed immediately after the launches. Seoul is closely monitoring the situation and is working with the U.S. to analyze the projectile. The U.S. and Japan have both confirmed North Korea's firing of short-range projectiles. In an interview with Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, a senior Trump administration official said Washington is aware of the situation but declined to comment any further. A senior Japanese official told Tokyo-based Kyoto News that Japan understands the projectiles to be short-range missiles, but the official added that they didn't affect Japan's national security because they didn't go as far as Japan's exclusive economic zone. So when we're actually expecting dialogue to resume soon between North Korea and the U.S., the North ends up firing short-range missiles. Now the question is, why now? And what's the regime's motive behind its latest launch? Our Oh Jung-hee explains. The downturn started when North Korea lashed out at South Korea and the U.S. for scheduling a joint military exercise next month. Three weeks after North Korea's Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump had a friendly chat at the inter-Korean border, the North slammed the exercise last week through its state media, saying the exercise would put the working-level nuclear talks at risk. Pyongyang warned that it'll decide what to do based on what the U.S. does. Since then, the North has done nothing to indicate that it'll engage in the working-level talks with Washington it promised. And at the same time, the two sides will miss another opportunity for their top diplomats to talk, with diplomatic sources saying North Korea recently notified Thailand that its foreign minister, Ri yong ho won't be attending the ASEAN regional forum next week. Pundits say Pyongyang doesn't mean to completely kill the momentum for dialogue. Firing the short-range missiles, rather, was a strategic choice. In May, when the North fired short-range missiles, Trump called them, quote, very standard stuff. But experts point out that the North has been steadily unveiling new weapons, aiming to gain an upper hand in its negotiations with the U.S. Firing short-range missiles means that the North can shoot ICBMs at the end of the year, and revealing a new submarine means it can fire SLBMs. If the North were to fire these, that would nullify Trump's achievements in North Korea policy. Another expert points out the security guarantee the North wants. Unveiling these weapons would give the North more leverage in its nuclear negotiations with the U.S. and at the same time strongly press the U.S. that it needs to do something to guarantee the North Korean regime's security. The North's firing of short-range missiles would not hurt the relationship between Kim and Trump, analysts say. But with the soonest chances for dialogue now gone, the missile launch would indeed delay any talks even further. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. South Korea has handed over proof to Russia that it had indeed intruded Korean airspace earlier this week. Both countries held talks today over Tuesday's incident, during which the Russian side said it will immediately send the evidence to Moscow's defense ministry. Kan yong reports. South Korea's Ministry of National Defense gave the evidence of a Russian warplane's intrusion into Korean airspace to the Russian military officials on Thursday. Holding working-level talks with the Russian military attaché at Seoul's defense ministry earlier in the day, the South Korean side explained in detail the evidence that confirms the Russian warplane's violation of Korean airspace. The defense ministry added that the Russian side said it will promptly pass on the information to Moscow's defense ministry for the ongoing investigation into the incident. Coming out of the working-level talks, the Russian military attaché who expressed regret over the incident when summoned on Tuesday did not make any comment. 
The two countries have been at odds over the flight route of a Russian warplane. Seoul has said that a Russian A-50 aircraft intruded Korean airspace over the East Sea twice near Tokdo Island. But the Russian embassy in South Korea tweeted that Moscow has not confirmed any airspace intrusion and it plans to investigate the situation before giving its official stance to Seoul. China, which conducted the joint flight drill with Russia, sided with Moscow on the issue. During the flight, the bombers of the two air forces strictly observed the relevant provisions of international law and never entered other countries' territorial airspace. But the newly appointed U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper said a Russian warplane crossed into South Korean airspace and it's not new that Russians have been flying routes south. Esper added that he will discuss the incident when he is next in the region. Kanyu, Arirang News. Let's turn now to the continuing trade spat between South Korea and Japan. At a highly charged meeting of the World Trade Organization on Wednesday, South Korea slammed Japan's export curves and directly called on Tokyo to start dialogue. Japan, however, did not answer. Our Trey Xiong reports. South Korea's Deputy Trade Minister Kim Seung-ho explained how Japan's export curves are a direct violation of the global trade rules and amount to diplomatic retaliation. And he urged Japan to start high-level talks. Japanese ambassador evade to give us a uh, concrete answer. So I ask again to respond to my proposed offer. But he uh, flatly turned down without giving me any plausible uh, the reasons. Kim didn't single out which specific provisions of the WTO rules Japan is violating, but said Tokyo's restrictions do not serve what Japan is claiming are national security interests. Rather, he said they will only hurt other countries and individual consumers. By not disclosing too much information, Kim's strategy seemed to take into account the possibility of Seoul suing Tokyo at the WTO, in which saying too much could give Japan the upper hand. Other WTO member states, including the U.S., didn't express an opinion on the matter publicly. Some had thought the semiconductor materials subject to the ban might have been shipping from Japan anyway, but industry insiders say they have not been arriving in South Korean customs. Some experts in South Korea are projecting that Japan's next move to remove Seoul from its trade whitelist might not happen right away but be dragged into August. Industry insiders also say that Japan is not likely, as had been thought, to encourage its financial institutions to collectively disadvantage Korean companies and consumers, for example by refusing to extend the maturity dates on their loans. But some experts say individual Japanese companies might take some action against Korean firms. In the meantime, as South Korea raises international awareness of Japan's export curves, it's also preparing for measures to counter them, including a WTO complaint. Choi Seung, Arirang News. Meanwhile, South Korean lawmakers are gearing up efforts to tackle Japan's export curbs to Korea by raising global awareness on the issue. A ruling party-led committee to tackle Japan's economic retaliation held a press conference addressing the foreign press earlier today. The group of lawmakers that went to Washington is also set to begin talks with their counterparts in the coming hours. Kim Mogyeon with the details. The ruling Democratic Party's Special Committee on the Japanese Economic Aggression held a press conference with foreign correspondents on Thursday to raise awareness of the unfairness of Japan's export curbs. Speaking at the Seoul Foreign Correspondents Club in central Seoul, committee chief and ruling Democratic Party lawmaker Choi jae sung said that Japan's retaliation is groundless. Japan has been citing several issues, including a supposed loss of trust over wartime disputes, an alleged inability in the part of South Korea to control strategic materials, and a review by Japan on the way it manages its exports. The four-term lawmaker said Japan is disrupting the global value chain and the international economic order, and that Japan will have to pay a price at the international level. Japan has already imposed export restrictions on key materials. Our committee will ask the Korean government to refer Japan to the UN Security Council. The committee also questioned Japan's qualifications to host the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, citing the Olympic philosophy of peace. They demanded that Japan immediately withdraw the existing export restrictions and its plan to exclude South Korea from its white list of trusted importers. Meanwhile, over in Washington, a delegation of South Korean lawmakers are working to express Seoul's concerns there. 
On Thursday local time, the delegation will meet with Senator Tom Cotton, who is known to be close to President Trump, and Representative Ted Yoho, a ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific and Nonproliferation. The following day, the delegation will participate on a biannual debate with their counterparts from the U.S. and Japan on economic and diplomatic issues. There, the lawmakers are set to deliver a resolution unanimously signed by Parliament's Foreign Affairs and Unification Committee calling for Japan to withdraw its trade curbs. Kim mok Arirang News. A U.S.-based think tank has warned that the South Korea-Japan trade conflict is a, quote, full-blown emergency which the U.S. should actively step in to resolve. The Center for Strategic and International Studies says that on their recent visits to South Korea, U.S. officials saw the need for trilateral cooperation. And because Seoul and Tokyo were not talking to each other, the center recommended the U.S. to encourage a leaders' summit on the sidelines of the upcoming U.N. General Assembly. It also said Washington must take a firm stand at the highest levels about the importance of these relationships to American interests. Now, a consensus seems to be growing in other countries, especially the United States, that Japan's export curbs on Seoul will hurt the global economy. Some in the U.S. are even concerned that the measures could help China, currently embroiled in a trade war with Washington. Kim hye sung with more. Japan's export restrictions target key high-tech materials, namely etching gas, fluorine polyamide and photoresist, which are used by South Korean IT firms to make semiconductors and display panels. Regarding the export curbs, U.S. think tank the American Enterprise Institute released an article criticizing Japan's move as dangerous and destructive, saying that it is likely to greatly disrupt global electronic supply chains and bolster China's push for 5G wireless dominance. Author Cloud Barfield, a former consultant to the U.S. Trade Representative, said he is not taking sides on the history of Korea and Japan, but that it is imperative that Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe be persuaded to suspend the export restrictions. Another article by the AEI said it's time for the Trump administration to step in and deal with both Seoul and Tokyo at a time when the three-party alliance is important for tackling North Korea-related issues. Global consulting company IHS Market also said Japan's export restrictions add pressure to Asian exporters amid the ongoing U.S.-China trade tensions and a slowing global electronics sector. Six U.S. business groups, including the Semiconductor Industry Association, also sent an open letter to South Korea and Japan calling for an timely resolution to the matter as Japan's unilateral export restrictions hurt the supply chain and IT companies. A Bloomberg editorial said Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is abusing trade measures to resolve a political dispute with South Korea and called for a lifting of the export restrictions while saying South Korea should agree to arbitration over the forced labor issue. CNBC said Japan's export curbs could disrupt the global manufacturing supply chain, raise chip prices and add to worries of an already slowing global economy. Kim hye sung Arirang News. U.S. President Donald Trump has on various occasions hinted at the need for its allies to pay more of their shared defense costs. And with less than six months left on Seoul and Washington's current agreement, negotiations for next year are likely to begin soon. Eat you on with more. The U.S. is in the final stage of reviewing its defense cost-sharing agreement and is likely to explain the results of that review to South Korea soon. This is according to Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency on Thursday, citing a foreign affairs source. This would mean that the defense cost-sharing negotiations could resume soon. The Blue House also said the two allies' national security advisors, Chong Yong and John Bolton, agreed in their discussion on Wednesday to continue talks on defense cost-sharing in a reasonable and fair way. However, it is likely that the U.S. will push for Seoul to contribute more. The Allies agreed in February that South Korea would pay 924 million U.S. dollars for the stationing of American troops in 2019, an on-year hike of 8.2 percent. While such an agreement is normally a five-year deal, the U.S. insisted that the latest agreement is only for one year, which is seen as a move to allow Washington to keep pushing for increases. 
In fact, President Trump, while not specifying which nation, called the defense cost sharing with an unidentified country a, quote, one-sided horrible deal and said that they will call on that country to give more. The U.S. had also asked for a significant increase in their previous negotiation for this year's agreement, which was 1.3 times what South Korea was paying last year. Now there are some voices saying that South Korea needs to follow Washington's request at a time like this, when both Seoul and Tokyo are trying to win Washington's support over Japan's trade restrictions on South Korea. However, experts say that if that happens, Washington would likely keep requesting more and more, and that Seoul needs to show that its current contribution is not unfair. If Seoul says that the U.S. should downsize its true presence in the South or even pull out, it would be diminishing the U.S. role and presence in the region. And that's not what Washington would want. South Korea's current contribution is more than 10 times what it was in the 1990s. Seoul should be more active in showing how much it is contributing when dealing with the U.S. The two sides will be aiming to sign a new deal before the current one expires at the end of the year. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. In a bid to encourage corporate investment here in Korea, the government has announced a revised tax code on Thursday, which will help to lower some burden on companies. Our Song Kyung tells us more. The Ministry on Economy and Finance has introduced a revised tax code starting in 2020, focusing on providing tax incentives to Korean companies. The aims of the changes are to cultivate new technologies, create jobs, and boost the domestic economy. Recent sluggish corporate investment in Korea and slumping global trade have largely contributed to the government decision. In fact, construction and facility investment in Korea has seen negative growth since the second quarter of last year. The revised tax code increases the tax credits for facility investment from 1% of the investment to 2% of the investment for large companies. For mid-sized companies, tax credits increase from 3% to 5% of investment, and small-sized companies will see their tax credits rise from 7% of investment to 10% of their facility investment. This change will be applied next year and is expected to reduce the tax burden on companies by nearly 450 million U.S. dollars. The new tax plan also includes tax incentives for employment crisis areas suffering from large-scale bankruptcy or restructuring of enterprises. Currently, any companies that open their businesses in those areas will be 100 percent exempt from paying corporate tax for five years. The revised tax code will also give these companies a 50 percent tax cut for the following two years. In addition, the revised tax plan offers extended tax support to SMEs, which hire women whose career have been interrupted. Seon Kyung, Arirang News. Well, are we finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? In a dramatic turnaround from the previous quarter, when South Korea's GDP shrank by the largest amount since the 2008 financial crisis, the local economy is estimated to have grown in the second quarter. Our Kim Dami explains. South Korea's GDP grew by an estimated 1.1 percent in April to June period. According to Bank of Korea, the figure marks the highest on-quarter growth since the third quarter of 2017, when the economy grew 1.5 percent. The country's economy grew at an annualized rate of 2.1 percent in the second quarter, also marking the highest growth since the final quarter of 2018. But it's not all good news because the previous quarter's figure was so low and also because the growth was largely thanks to the government's increased spending. The growth was partly caused by the government's increased spending on health care benefits. Government spending increased by 2.5 percent, which is a huge jump from the 0.4 percent increase in the previous quarter. Experts in the second quarter increased 2.3 percent from three months earlier, thanks to increased exports of motor vehicles and semiconductors. Imports also went up by 3 percent, owing to increased imports of machinery. Facilities investment grew by 2.4 percent, led by the growth of investment in transportation equipment. Private consumption also picked up pace, growing 0.7 percent with increased expenditures on clothing and medical services. 
Even though the GDP growth rebounded to a positive number, the data doesn't show good signs for the country's economy. Both exports and facility investment actually dropped compared to the same period last year. Real gross domestic income, or GDI, decreased by 0.6 percent compared to the previous quarter because of the worsened trade terms. With exports on a steady decline since December and electronics industry facing Japan's export restrictions, analysts note that it will be a challenge to reach the central bank's economic growth forecast of 2.2 percent. South Korea's GDP needs to reach above 0.8 percent in the third and final quarters of the year in order to reach the central bank's economic growth forecast. While the Bank of Korea says it's too early to comment on the country's economic growth, it says it will carefully monitor the U.S.-China trade war as well as Japan's latest export curbs. Kim Dami, Arirang News. With growing calls to reduce dependence on supply chains starting in Japan, South Korea has been stepping up efforts to develop self-sufficiency for high-tech materials. And that's why President Moon Jae-in hailed a new job creation deal that was signed today between the government and LG Chem. Our Park hee with the details. President Moon Jae-in welcomed the new job creation project named after the city of Kumi where it debuted on Thursday. He described these Kumi-type jobs as a key solution that will help give South Korea a competitive edge in building its own supply of essential materials. The Kumi type jobs were announced Thursday at a ceremony in their namesake southeastern city, attended by around 500 people from the government, LG Chem, and the local districts. President Moon congratulated LG Chem and the other parties to the deal, the Gyeongsangbuk-do province and Kumi city governments, on having formed the first such program since the launch of Gwangju type jobs in January this year. Through this project, LG Chem plans to build a 420 million U.S. dollar factory in the city that can produce an annual 60,000 tons of essential materials used to make secondary batteries. Secondary batteries are used to make electric cars and smartphones. This factory is expected to be up and running by 2024 and should create around 8,000 new jobs. Coming at a crucial time when South Korea is going all out to enhance its industrial competitiveness, President Moon said it's a chance to reaffirm the country's confidence that it can overcome the effects of Japan's trade restrictions. Unlike traditional manufacturing jobs, Kumi-type jobs are high quality and center around the high-tech material industry. Secondary batteries are seen as a promising field of high growth with potential beyond that of semiconductors. The project will help cut South Korea's reliance on overseas supplies for secondary battery materials, which is expected to boost the country's global competitiveness in future industries. President Moon vowed to further promote Kumi-type jobs in more areas across the country. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News. The match, which many Korean football fans have been waiting for, is happening tomorrow to not tonight, or tomorrow night, that is. Fan-voted K-League All-Star players are to face Juventus on Friday evening at 8 p.m. Korea time. On the eve of the big match, big names such as Park Ju young and Cho hyun woo have gathered under Jose Moraes, head coach of Cheonbuk Hyundai Motors, to prepare to take on the reigning Italian league champions Juventus at Seoul World Cup Stadium. And players representing the K-League say they are looking forward to the match. I would like to thank all the fans who voted for me to compete against Juventus. I'm honored personally, and in return, I will try my best to give a great performance. Now, uh, the, led by global star Cristiano Ronaldo, Juventus will arrive in Seoul on the morning of the friendly match. All 65,000 tickets for the match sold out in less than three hours. North Korea's national carrier Air Korea will reportedly start direct flights from Pyongyang to Macau next month. News reports say the state-run airline will fly the new route twice a week from August 2nd to October 26th. 
Air Cordero had direct flights to Macau before, but in the 1990s. Right now, its only direct regular flights are to Beijing and Shenyang in China and Vladivostok in Russia. Korean convenience stores are joining the boycott of Japan over the two countries' trade spat by scrapping their discounts on Japanese beer. The chain CU, for example, will be excluding Japanese brands such as Asahi and Sapporo from their popular four cans for ten deals starting next month. They'll give that deal instead for Korean beer. Some stores have taken Japanese beer off their shelves completely. A second world record has been smashed at the World Aquatics Championships in Kwangju. Christoph Milak of Hungary set the world's fastest time in the men's 200-metre butterfly event on Wednesday, capturing his first title in the process. He clocked in at 1 minute 50.73 seconds. The previous world record was held for a decade by American swimming legend Michael Phelps. The biggest annual Korean martial arts event, the World Taekwondo Hanmadang, will kick off in Pyeongchang tomorrow for a five-day run. Practitioners will compete in 12 events in 59 fields for domestic participants and 54 for those from overseas. The festival brings together nearly 5,000 people from 57 countries. That has been your three-minute news flash. The last round of this year's monsoon rain is upon us. And the showers are looking pretty heavy at the moment. For more details, let's turn to our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle. The monsoon is in full swing as rains continue to lash in various parts of the country. The rain clouds are expected to linger above the northern regions tomorrow, soaking Seoul and its surrounding areas with bucket loads of rain. And meanwhile, Beijing will have a sunny but scorching day tomorrow with the mercury expected to reach near 40 degrees Celsius. And Chuncheong, the provinces have an issue with heavy rain alert, expecting to receive more than 400 millimeters of rain until Sunday morning. Seoul and the surrounding regions will get a heavy amount of 250 millimeters. And Friday commute will be humid and hot with most regions reaching at least 24 degrees Celsius. And the high in Seoul will soar up to 28 degrees tomorrow with southern regions seeing their readings soaring into their 30s. And like I said, this will be the last monsoon rain of the season. And as of next week, the nation will get to experience more heat waves and also tropical nights. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thank you as always for watching. And News in Depth is next.